Hello guys and gals, and this is another reading of Phantasmagoria, and we are almost done with it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> excuse me, um, in the last episode, in, um, part 10, we read about, uh, Cerberus, Black Dogs and Death Hounds, The Phoenix, The Thunderbird, and The Rock, not to be confused with Dwayne Johnson. Anyways, um, in this episode, we will be reading The Cymurg, uh, Feathered Fiends, Mermaids, Nixies and Nymphs, Scylla and Charybdis. And uh, we are going to dive right into this. This is basically Phantasmagoria is a book by Julia Bruce. It is copyright 2009. And it is an atlas of fabulous creatures, enchanted beings, and magical monsters. And so we're going to get right into this. This is part 11 of 13. So we are getting way near the end. Let's figure out where we uh, left off. My phone keeps... There's a short in my cord or something, but... We're just going to plug it. That's fine. Anyways, um... Okay, we read about the Greek dragons already. Uh, we read about the phoenix. Thunderbird, the rock. Okay. And we are to the Cymurg. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not. It says here, the Cymurg is... Oh, wow. And this whole page is just, um... A picture. It's a really cool picture at that. Okay, so it says here, part bird, part lion, and part dog, the Cymurg of ancient Persia was certainly mixed up. Like the rock, not Dwayne Johnson, it was also a giant of the sky, so big it could carry a whale and its giant claws. But despite its great size and frightening appearance, the Cymurg was a wise and good creature. The Cymurg was certainly a strange beast to look at. It had the head of a dog, the body of a lion, and the wings and tail of a peacock. Persian, Iranian legends say the Cymurg lived in the Tree of Life, a magical tree whose seeds were supposed to cure every disease. The Cymurg shook the tree and scattered the seeds all over the world so that people everywhere could have healing plants. The touch of a Cymurg, Cymurg feather was also said to have the power to cure the sick. The Cymurg was very old and wise. It had lived so long that it, that it had seen the destruction of the world three times over. Some stories say it was, it was consumed by fire every 1,700 years and then reborn again in much the same way as the phoenix. According to one old Persian myth, the Cymurg once found a baby abandoned in the rocky wasteland near where it lived. She took pity on the child, a boy called Zal. I think that that's an, an L, right? Zal? And looked after him for many years. Um, let's see. Sorry about that. I lost my place. Uh, uh, oh. She took pity on a child, a boy called Zal, and looked after him for many years, bringing him up in the t and teaching him the ways of the world. When at last the time came for Zal to make his own way in life, the Simur gave him one of her golden breast feathers and told him to cast it in the fire if he ever needed her needed her help. Zal left the Cymurg with a heavy heart, but he he went back into the world. Oh, but he went back into the world, inherited a kingdom which he ruled wisely, and married a beautiful girl. When his wife started giving birth to their first child, Zal realized the baby was too big and that both mother and child were in grave danger. He cast the Cymurg feather into the fire. The great bird appeared instantly and safely delivered the child, who was named Rustam, and grew up to be a great Persian hero. Uh, it says, right, here the Cymurg finds abandoned baby Zal and carries him to her nest. The illustration is from a 16th century version of the Shan Shanama? Shanama. An epic book of Persian myths. Iranian myths. And there he is. It was nice of her to take in the abandoned child. Anyways, let's read about the Garuda. It says here, Garuda is a divine man-bird. King of the birds. In the Hindu myths of India, he along with the, uh, the eight elephants that support the universe was born from a cosmic egg at the beginning of the world. 
he is a he is a huge and fantastic creature with the body of a man, but the wings and beak of an eagle. Garuda shines brighter than the sun and can easily fly across the universe. He was born hating all evil things and flew around the world devouring anything he came across that was bad or wicked. Like the Cybermerg, he is the mortal enemy of snakes. Garuda is often ridden by the great Hindu god Vishnu and his female counterpart Laksh Lakshmi. Oh, wait. It says here that god Vishnu is is said to ride on the back of Garuda, the divine manbird. Okay, let's move on. Feathered Fiends. Okay, I'm checking to see if I need to not show some stuff, but it looks like everything here is at least PG. Feathered Fiends. As At first, you can hardly hear anything, just a faint but beautiful sound carried on the wind. It's so haunting and lovely that you're, you're strained to hear more. The singing grows louder and more intense until it blocks out everything else in your mind. It is beautiful and terrible at the same time, but you cannot resist it. You cannot escape the song of the siren. Okay, how to escape the siren song. Let's read about that. Uh, plug your ears so you cannot hear their enchanted singing. Ask someone to restrain you so you cannot follow the song. Play music yourself that is even more beautiful than their singing. The lyre player Orpheus did this effect efficiently in the Greek story of Jason and the Argonauts. Make loud noises to drown out their singing their song. In Russia, people use cannon fire and bells to cover the song of the siren. And it says right here, um, I think that's for this one. Uh, lashed firmly to the mast of his ship, Odysseus was saved from the unearthly song of the sirens. There's the sirens right there. Okay, so let's read about the sirens. I think those are harpies. No, the, the those are sirens also. Okay, in the myth of, of the ancient Greek... In, Oh, in the myth of the ancient Greeks, the sirens were beautiful maidens with human heads but the bodies, wings, and legs of birds, whose enchanted singing lured ships to their doom on the sharp, treacherous rocks surrounding their island home. The terrible sirens would then devour the unfortunate shipwrecked sailors, tearing them to pieces with their hooked talons. They made their nest among among the bleached bones of their victims. One of the most, one of the most famous tales of the sirens involved Odysseus, the hero of the Trojan War, who had, who had to sail past their island on his long voyage home. Odysseus managed to escape their deadly song by telling his crew to stop to stop up their ears with wax, blocking out the fateful song. But he himself was burning with curiosity to hear the siren's song, so he ordered his men to lash him to the mast, preventing him from leaping into the water in an attempt to reach the malicious maidens. This the crew did, and though he struggled wildly to escape, when he heard the singing, the ropes held, held, the ropes held, and Odysseus survived unscathed. Now we're going to talk about siren, which is uh, apparently different than the sirens. I don't know. It says the beautiful and deadly song of the Russian siren makes ordinary mortals forget everything and abandon their loved ones. Okay, that sounds tragic. Okay, let's read about the siren then. After we read this fantastic fact. It says, although they had wings, the sirens couldn't fly. They f the, their flight feathers were removed as a punishment when they lost a music contest with the muses, goddesses of the arts. Okay, now let's talk about the Russian siren. Russian folklore f features a similar creature, the siren, which has the head and face of a beautiful maiden and the body of a bird, usually an owl. If you were a saint, you had nothing to fear from siren, who would sing your sing you beautiful songs about the joys of eternal life. Mere mortals, however, had had much more to worry about. If they heard the siren song, they would forget everything and follow the siren blindly until they eventually died of starvation and exhaustion. Now, let's talk, let's read about, I don't know how to pronounce this. Blood, Bloodwed? I think. Let me take a look at this picture here, and it says, Beautiful Bloodwed, was turned into an owl and doomed to a solitary existence for her 
faithlessness. Okay. It says here, in the legend from Wales, in, the, in this legend from Wales, young Prince Lu was under a curse that meant he could not take a human a human wife. His uncle, a magician, came up with an unusual solution. He conjured himself up a beautiful bride made from flowers. He called her Bloodwed or Flower Face. Flower Face. And for some time, the couple were very happy. But when Lou went away for a few days, the disloyal Bloodwed immediately fell in love with another man named Grom. No, Gron. I'm not sure that W. Gron. We'll say Gron. Uh, the underhand pair tried to kill Lou when he transformed into an eagle and flew away. But he transformed to an eagle and flew away. Lovers were delighted at his departure, but they didn't enjoy their victory for long. Lou's uncle found out and restored his human form, and Lou returned and killed Grom. Bron, rather. At the end of the tale, the uncle turns the treacherous bloodwen, bloodwed, into an owl, destined to be forever shunned by other birds and live only by night. Okay, and we are ready for another one. Oh, wait. Water creatures. Again, we will we will cover these um, in episode 13. But for now, we are just going to read this right here. It says, More than 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with water, mostly, mostly in the form of the vast oceans whose depths humans haven't yet fully explored. For centuries, sailors have reported seeing strange creatures on the high seas, from mermaids to giant serpents. Uh, there are also deep, dark lakes, remote rivers, and underground springs, who is, to, who is to say that unidentified creatures may lurk in these remote places? These areas, such as Loch Ness in Scotland and Loch Lake Champlain in Canada, are renowned for sightings of strange, prehistoric-looking creatures, while according to legend, rivers and streams conceal a range of monstrous beasts and beautiful water spirits. Again, we will go more in-depth into maps later. Okay, there is a mermaid. I'm not going to show the first part, front part of that. But, um, let's see. Okay, it says here, fantastical fact. We're going to be careful what we show here. Um, mermaid sightings may actually have been glimpses of sea mammals such as the dugong or the now extinct Stellar's sea cow. And some people say manatee. They, the manatees are still around, I think. Mermaids. Mermaids have cropped up in stories from around the world for centuries. In the myths of the people of the Pacific Islands, for example, humans um, actually begin as mer people. At the beginning of the world, Tangero, god of the sea, gave birth to all the creatures of the ocean, including mermen and mermaids, who eventually lost their tails and became human. Okay, so, let's see here. Ah, this is going to be hard to read, so bear with me. We're going to Look up here at this mer dude. Uh, mermaids have mermaids have cropped up in stories from around the world for century. Oh, I read that. In the folklore of, of Europe and America, mermaids have the head and body of a beautiful maiden and the tail of a fish. They live in the sea in a splendid underwater world of beautifully adorned palaces, overflowing with riches. Mermaids live. Oh, mermaids' lives are very long. But the one thing they lack is a soul. Sailors would once tell tales of seeing mermaids sitting on rocks, combing their long hair, admiring themselves in mirrors, and singing sweet songs. Mermaids are fascinated by the world of men. Some can, some can even shapeshift, exchanging their tails for legs and coming onto land when they might seek, human, uh, seek a human husband. If they do marry a human man, however, their children will have webbed feet, or oh, webbed fingers, rather, and toes. In some stories, mermaids help humans healing people who are ill, for example. But these, but their songs can also lure sailors to their deaths, and their singing is sometimes said to foretell terrible storms. Um, when mermaids, oh, while mermaids are beautiful, mermen are said to have a terrifying appearance with green skin and ugly faces. They are wild and uncontrolled, often causing storms and sinking ships. In Irish legends, mermaids are called marrows. M-E-R-R-O-W-S. The females are alluring and friendly, but male marrows 
are not. They have green teeth, slit-like eyes, and sharp red noses. In Scotland, people talk of, of selkies, seal people who can take on human form. They often marry humans and live on land, but they also keep their seal skin hidden away, and when, they, when the pull of the sea is very strong, will put it back on and return once again to the water. Now let's read about storm warnings. Um, Japanese mermaids, or mingyo, are friendly and helpful if treated with respect. They have the bodies of huge fish with the heads of beautiful women. Unlike mermaids of the West, they won't hurt, oh, they won't lure anyone into danger, but will warn humans of danger and ward off bad luck. Let's go to the Little Mermaid now. It says up here, The Little Mermaid is a fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. This statue of the Little Mermaid now stands in Copen Copenhagen, Harbor, Copenhagen, in Denmark, was the home of the author. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. In this, okay. The Little Mermaid. In the story by Hans Christian Andersen, a young mermaid falls in love with a human prince, whom she has saved from a shipwreck. She begs a wicked merwitch, a sea witch, to transform her tail into human legs so she can go ashore and be with the prince. The witch agrees, but imposes harsh conditions. She takes the mermaid's beautiful voice as payment. She curses her so that every step she takes will be agony. And worst of all, if the little mermaid doesn't make the prince fall in love with her, she will die. Sadly for the little, merma little mermaid, the prince believes a human princess saved him from drowning. Although he grows to love the little mermaid as a sister, he falls in love and marries the princess instead. The merwitch gives the little mermaid one more chance. If she will kill the prince, she can save her own life. But the little mermaid cannot do it. Instead, she plunges back into the sea and turns into foam. That is very sad. Okay. There's an image I need to censor. Nixies and nymphs. There's a picture down here that I can't exactly show. So, um... We're going to cover it up. Okay, it says, While mermaids generally make their home in the sea, nixies and nymphs are creatures of rivers, streams, and lakes. Beautiful but, uh, but often deadly, these water spirits can lure people to watery deaths. Okay, let's read about Peg Prowler and Jenny Greenteeth. Wait, this sounds familiar. This is actually in World of Warcraft on the, at the Dark Moon Fair. You find Jenny Greenteeth. And she sells delicacies made out of the um, the races of Azeroth, which is kind of freaky. So let's read about Peg Prowler, Peg Prowler and Jenny Greenteeth. If you ever are in northern England, be careful near lakes, rivers, mill races, and wells. A wicked being may lurk beneath the surface, waiting to drag you under the water. In the river Tees lives Peg Prowler, a hideous, ugly old woman with green skin, long, lank, green hair, and sharp teeth, who grabs the ankles of those who stand too close to the water and pulls them in. Other water, water demons, such as Jenny Green Teeth and the frightening Grindy Lows, uh, have just the same evil intent. That is, to drown any people, particularly any children, who come too close. Now, let's read about... Um, Okay, I should probably censor that, too. We're going to censor that, too. Um, sorry, I just had to censor this because, um, yeah. A painting with bare, bare boobs, and I'm not going to put that on my channel. Um, in appearance, Nixies of German and Scandinavian folktales are much like mermaids with the heads and bodies of a beautiful young girl and the tail of a fish. They can also take human form, but you can always tell them by the hems of their skirts, which are dripping wet. Nixies are known to snatch human babies, replacing them with changelings that are invariably ugly. In other European myths, nymphs are water spirits. In Greek stories, every river, lake, and spring has its own nymph or, ni or ni ni naiad. If the water ever dries up, the naiad will die with it. Unlike Nixies, naiads have no particular hatred of people. Even so, they can be jealous and dangerous. Hylas, one of the Argonauts, see page 95, was a beautiful 
young man who fascinated a group of naiads he encouraged oh he encountered in a spring while fetching water. They enticed him into the water into their watery home, and he was never seen again. When the human lover of a naiad called Nomia was unfaithful to her, she was so enraged that she blinded him. German folktale oh, German folklore tells of a knight who married a water nymph only to desert her and marry another woman. But the nymph got her revenge. She made sure that the faithless knight drowned on his wedding day. Okay, that's kind of harsh. Okay, I think this is, yeah, this is this is fine right here. It says, um, according to the legend, some water nymphs were so enraptured by the beauty and youth Hylas who came to their spring that they took him to stay with them forever. Okay, I can show some of these. That's part of it. Uh, the part I can show. Um, oh, it says below, um, beautiful white-clad Raskalki Rus dance in the woods beneath the new moon. They're singing, luring the unwary to their deaths. We're going to read about the the, the Rusalka now. In Russia and Eastern Europe, traditional lore has it that the souls of girls who die violent deaths in or near water become spirits called Rusalki, water nymphs who lure men into the water and drown them. Rusalki always have the appearance of beautiful maidens dressed in white. They are usually seen on, night, on nights when there is a new moon, singing and dancing in meadows and woodland clearings, drawing men to them. There are apparently two ways you can protect yourself against a Rusalki. If you go swimming in the lake where she lives, put a fern in your hair. If you want to help her troubled soul to rest in peace, find out how the ill-fated ill ill girl died and avenge her death. Now, we are going to read about Lorelei, and again, I can only show part of that picture. Um, tragic Lorelei um, combs her copper locks and sings her haunting song, the famous rock where she is said to recline. Um, juts out 120 meters above the River Rhine in Germany. Okay. Lorelei. I'm going to have to... Um, I'll put it up here so I can actually see this. It says here, uh, Lorelei. There was once a young maiden named Lorelei who lived next to the River Rhine in Germany. She was so beautiful that any man that looked into her eyes fell in love with her. Unfortunately, the one man she loved back was unfaithful to her. She wanted to take her own life, but a local bishop stopped her ask, ask, oh, and sent her to live in a convent instead. On the way there, however, she, hit, she halted at the edge of, the cli of, a cliff, oh, of the cliff overlooking the Rhine, from where she could see the castle of her beloved, and threw herself into the river. At that moment, she was transformed into a siren, and forever after would sit on a rock combing her long, copper-colored hair, and singing enchanted songs, luring sailors to their deaths on the dangerous rocks below. And this has been Nixies and Nymphs. See here, I'm just checking. We are going to read one more. Okay, and now we have Scylla and the Charybdis. All these look okay. At least PG-13. And again, the other images were PG-13. I just... Yeah. Let well, me make sure everything is completely copacetic here. Okay, let's look at this picture here. It looks like the people are getting eaten by something. Okay, it says here, according to Greek mythology, the twin horrors of, the, of Scylla and Charybdis made the Strait of Messina the most dangerous stretch of water in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, let's read about Scylla and Charybdis. The sea has always posed great dangers. Storms, whirlpools, uh, giant waves, treacherous reefs, and jagged rocks have all taken the lives of seafaring adventurers. You are not even safe on land. Floods, tidal surges, and tsunamis all bring destruction from the sea, so it's hardly surprising that the ancient Greeks imagined unspeakable sea monsters. Um, let's see. 
it says here, Odysseus and his crew navigate the perilous, perilous um, perilously close to Scylla in an attempt to avoid the equally dangerous Charybdis. Odysseus lost six men using this strategy, but saved the ship. Okay. On the opposite sides of the Strait of Messina, between, between, be, uh, between Sicily and the Italian mainland lay two inescapable terrors. On one side of the strait lived Charybdis, monstrous daughters of Poseidon, who swallowed huge amounts of water three times a day and then spouted it back out again, forming a seething mass of water that swirled in an everlasting whirlpool. Anything that approached Charybdis would be sucked down into the murky depth forever. But to avoid Charybdis meant passing too close to the horror on the other side of the strait, Scylla, the most monstrous creature imaginable, who had twelve legs, a circle of slathering dogs' heads at her waist, and six giant heads on writhing snake-like necks that plucked sailors from their boats if they passed within reach beneath her, ca beneath her cave. Two Greek heroes, Odysseus and Jason, successfully faced these monsters. Odysseus realized that he had to face one or the other of the foes. Oh. Odysseus, realizing that he had to face one or other one or other of the foes, chose to battle with Scylla. He calculated that, though he risked losing some of his, of his, some of his crew, the ship would escape the, the total destruction it was likely to suffer if they, set, if they sailed too near Charybdis. As expected, when the boat steered towards her lair, Scylla approached. Each of her terrible heads st struck at the boat. She snatched up six men, one with each head, but Odysseus managed to navigate out of her reach before she could strike again. Zeus later wrecked Odysseus' ship in a battle and found the oh. Zeus later wrecked Odysseus' ship in battle and the hero found himself stranded on a raft of wreckage drifting back towards the Strait of Messina to face the twin terrors of Scylla and Charybdis. For the second time, not daring to risk another encounter with Scylla, he passed near near to Charybdis instead. The raft was sucked into the whirlpool, but Odysseus managed to grab onto a branch of a fig tree that overhung the swirling water. When Charybdis spouted out water again, she expelled, the, she expelled his raft with it. Odysseus managed to swim to the raft and paddle away from danger. The hero Jason had better luck with his ship, the Argo. It had to pass through the strait on his return from Colchis, where he had stolen the Golden Fleece. See page 95. He was protected by the goddess Hera, who sent sea nymphs to sing soothing melodies that quieted the churning waters of Charybdis. The nymphs then guided the Argo away from Scylla's rock so, sh so she could not reach it. Um, okay, now we're going to read about Scylla. Scylla was a beautiful sea nymph, believed by a, by a sea god, oh, beloved by a sea god named Glacus. However, for Scylla, oh, unfortunately for Scylla, although she didn't love Glacus, the sorceress Circe did, and out of jealousy, Circe poisoned the pool where Scylla went to bathe. As soon as Scylla stepped into the water, she was transformed into a hideous monster. Her heart became filled with loathing. She made her lair at the Strait of Messina. Uh, she made her lair at the Strait of Messina, destroying everything that came within her reach. And lastly, we're going to read about Charybdis. Charybdis was also a sea nymph. She was the daughter of Poseidon, the chief god of the sea. It was her task to flood dry land for her father, thus increasing her, his underwater kingdom. One story says that Zeus became angry at at this theft of land, of, at this theft of his land, and turned Charybdis into a huge monster with a gaping mouth, sucking the water and churning it out again, creating a terrible whirlpool. And this has been okay. Well, in the next one, we're going to read about lake lurkers. That would be fun. But this has been Phantasmagoria. It is a book by Julia Bruce. Uh, it is an atlas of fabulous creatures and enchanted beings and magical monsters. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. All, and as always, thanks for watching everyone, and have a great day.